You would think the smell would be the worst part. And don't get me wrong, it was far from pleasant to say the least. That pungent odor, a stomach-turning scent like raw sewage. It wasn't just dirt and decay, no, it was far more disgusting than that. It had that awful metal tang to it. That meant when that awful stench crawled its way up your nose, it lingered, hanging at the back of your throat, choking you on the sickening reek that lay thick in the air like a foul-smelling fog. And yet, like I said, that was far from the worst part. What was? Well, even the sight of what had happened to him wasn't what made me feel unsettled. Hardly any of his body was visible, covered in that writhing, shifting cloak. But I could see it move, each tiny piece of the mass moving on its own. It made me imagine what it must have felt like to have all those little scratchy legs and pinchers, claws and teeth hooking into his skin. And that, the idea of what it would feel like, that was the worst part about seeing the vermin god. City life isn't really all it's cracked up to be. Ask anyone who lives in a big urban area, and they'll likely tell you the same. Those bright lights and tall spires reaching up to the clouds, they offer the promise of prosperity, opportunity, and even fame and fortune for those who are extra naive. But when they upped sticks, packed their bags, and moved here to start a new life, they realized that all along, they had been sold on a dream, a false fantasy that is just simply too good to be true. Of course, by the time they get here, it's already too late. And before they know it, they're knee-deep in debt, trying to keep up with paying rent on an apartment that's barely big enough for one person. If you aren't careful, a big city can swallow you up. Sometimes, literally. Never mind just desperately trying to make ends meet and keep yourself afloat. There's also plenty of danger to be found in the heart of the city. It doesn't take much for people to lose themselves in the darker parts of this metropolitan hell pretending it's a haven. And when they do, that's usually where my job starts. I've been working as a private investigator for coming up on a decade. My specific job title had gone through a number of rebrands and different combinations of terms over the years. Cassius Duke, detective for hire, then private eye and freelance investigator after that. And don't fall under the same sort of assumptions that most people do when they hear all those terms. Believe me, just like the city's promises, it rarely lives up to what you'd imagined it to be like. My life was never high-speed chases and gunfights, solving murders and tracking down crooks that robbed banks in clown masks. That was work for the real police, allegedly much higher above my pay grade now that I had quit. Most of the time I dealt with uncovering the various dirty little secrets this grimy city had to offer. More often than not, my job was working as either a spy or enforcer that anyone could hire. I followed around the rivals of wealthy businessmen, snapping photos of them with my camera to get any dirt I could that my more unethical clients would probably use for blackmail. Or I'd be warning stalkers to keep away from whoever they were causing trouble for, usually with a bit of gentle encouragement in the form of some pretty stern words and a rap on the knuckles of sorts. It was ugly work, but that suited just how ugly the underside of this whole city was. Some of my clients were often desperate people, folks who the ordinary system of law and order had failed. When that happened, when they had been turned away by the cops on the verge of losing any hope they had left, that was usually when they turned to me for help. Now, I don't work for free, of course. You get nothing for nothing. Everything's got its price, so on and so forth. But I wasn't looking to extort people, especially at their lowest moments. So, firm but fair, I charged them a little bit for my time. Maybe a finder's fee if I happened to come across some dirt that was really worth some extra cash. It was rare for me to take on a job pro bono, as it were, without expecting any pay for my services. But when this case landed in my lap, I felt obligated to do the job for free. It was another gray day in a gray city. A knock on the door interrupted me from my busy schedule of staring at the paint flaking off my ceiling. After I'd called them through, the person responsible for that knock came stepping cautiously into my office. He told me his name was Martin Jenkins, but that his friends called him Marty. Sorry, I, I don't really know how all this works, Martin admitted, making no attempt to mask how nervous he was. Well, why don't you take a seat first, I sighed. That's a start. Oh, uh, okay, he replied, awkwardly pulling up a chair and sitting down opposite my desk. So, Mr. Jenkins, what can I... Marty, he interjected. Mr. Jenkins, I repeated. What is it that brings you here? Well, 
Someone said you might be able to help with my, um, problem? Martin said sheepishly. And what sort of problem are you having, Mr. Jenkins? I pushed for him to give me a straight answer. I didn't really have a lot of patience for anyone who wasted time just getting to the point. Uh, it's my brother, you see. The other, Mr. Jenkins, he finally confessed. He's been missing. It's actually been months now. A missing person's case is a police matter. I'm sorry, but you'll have to go to them. As bad as it felt turning the guy down at a time like this, I had my profession to protect. If I wasn't careful, the cops would come down on me like a ton of bricks. I'd already ruffled up some feathers in that area not long before. I'd taken a case wherein I'd accidentally photographed some corrupt officers accepting bribes. One of those pictures wound up on the evening news. There'd been a target on my back ever since. But Detective Duke, Martin began to say. Mr. Duke, I corrected him. I've already tried going to the police. They wouldn't ex even accept a, a missing persons case when I explained what happened to my brother. Go on. I said, reaching for my notebook and a pen on the desk. I left the city a while ago after my brother and I, Melvin, his name's Melvin Jenkins. We, we had an argument. And what was it that triggered this argument? I asked, dragging my pen across the page. It was, well, a lot of things, Martin sighed. Our father died almost a year ago. It wasn't unexpected, but Mel took it pretty hard. Then the doctors told us the condition Dad had carried a chance of being hereditary, so we both went to get tested. I didn't show any signs of developing it, but Melvin did. He took it as a death sentence, got very low, and started wasting all of our inheritance on every vice he could get his hands on. Drinking, partying, gambling, you name it, he was doing it. And this led to the argument? I probed. It did. I confronted him before I left town. I was mad that he'd been using all our dad left us for such frivolous and irresponsible things. Marvin continued his story, almost unable to stop now he started. He didn't want to hear any of it. Said he was going to die eventually anyway, so what was the point? Then I told him he was selfish, and that was the last time we spoke. When did you notice he was missing? As soon as I came back from out of town, he answered. I went to the apartment. Dad had left us that too, along with all the payments still due, and I found that Mel was gone. Apparently, he had bet in a card game and lost badly. I had no way of finding him. Nobody else knew where he was. Let me guess. I stepped in. When you went to the police, they said he's most likely living on the street, which would make him a lot harder to find. Martin nodded solemnly, clearly feeling guilty for what had happened. Although from where I was sitting, it was his brother's own misgivings that had created this situation. I went on to ask a few more background questions before asking if Mr. Jenkins could provide me with a photo of his missing brother. He obliged, handing over a printed picture. The moment I saw it, I offered to take the case for free. His brother, Melvin. I recognized him almost instantly. He was in his mid or possibly late thirties. Average height and build in the picture, far better shape and a lot cleaner than when I'd seen him. But it was that same guy, that much I was sure of. No amount of unshaved stubble or disheveled clothing could change that. I had seen him, seen Melvin, outside my building a few times, sleeping rough on the sidewalk. Every day that I showed up to start another day of work, I'd drop him a few dollars, anything I had in my wallet. At first, I told myself it was for good luck, so I didn't attract any bad karma for myself, but when I actually paid attention to how he was living, the gesture became what it should have been from the start. It wasn't about me or sparing myself bad luck, it was just about trying to help out someone who needed it when I was in a position to do him a small kindness at the very least. One night I just locked up my office and I was about to head home. As I stepped off the curb, head down, eyes on my phone, a truck came speeding down the street. I would have been killed instantly had a hand not grabbed me and pulled me back onto the sidewalk. Melvin had hauled me out of harm's way. He didn't say anything to me, and I failed to do anything more than just thank him verbally before heading home. So, I figured I owed him one. Well, I didn't tell his brother this, it had been a few months since I last seen Melvin outside my building. I'd always assume he moved on, or been asked to move by an overzealous cop. Of course, that meant figuring out where he was going was going to be tricky. Exactly the reason the police had turned Martin away when he'd asked them for help locating his brother. But I had a few connections that, even if they hadn't seen Melvin, might have at least heard something, or could know someone else that had seen him. It wasn't a lead yet, but it was a start. Dee was the head of the city's biggest homeless shelter and a good friend of mine, so she became my first port of call. I showed her the photo of Melvin and asked if he'd come to stay at the shelter recently. Doesn't ring a bell, I'm afraid. She looked somberly at the picture. Sorry, Duke. I wish I could be more help. Not on you. 
I replied, taking the photo as she handed it back to me. You mind if I ask around, see if anyone here recognizes him? Be my guest, Dee said. I spent about an hour milling around, asking a few down-on-their-luck folks if they recognized the man in the photo. A few of them mentioned they'd seen him around here and there, sleeping rough in a number of different parts of the city, but none of them could give me anything concrete, no definite location I'd be able to search next. That was until one of them spoke up. He was an older guy, bedabbled clothes and unwashed hair with a thick beard, who had been craning his neck to try and sneak a look at the photo when I'd been showing someone else. I seen him, the man, Clarence, said matter-of-factly. You recognize this man? I asked to verify. Said I seen him, he repeated. Looks different now, though. Well, that's to be expected, I replied. I don't mean he's gotten skinnier because he ain't been eaten, Clarence said in retort. I mean that he don't even look like he's human no more. But what does that mean? I questioned, looking back at the bearded man in confusion. That man right there stopped being a man. No idea when or how it happened, but last time I saw him, it was already too late. Nowadays, he's the vermin god. I didn't really have much of an idea of how to respond. Unsure if Clarence was pulling my leg and deliberately wasting my time, or if there was some truth to this bizarre urban legend. At any rate, it was the only real lead I had so far, albeit a tenuous one at best. So I pressed the old man to tell me where he'd seen Melvin, of this vermin god, as he kept calling him. There's an abandoned warehouse down on the waterfront, Clarence had explained. I knew the place he meant. It used to be a go-to for people who were sleeping rough. Lots of us used to stay there, but that's when the pests got bad. Pests? What kind of pests? All kinds. Rats, roaches, you name it. Then just we were having to deal with them, the company that owned the building sent cops down to clear us out, told us it was unsafe and we should move on. It was sitting there, empty for ages, so I decided to chance it, head down there and see if we could start using the place again. But when I went to look, he was there, waiting in the dark. And he wasn't alone. He ain't ever alone. They're always with him, all around him. I chose to ignore Clarence's attempts at unnerving me getting him to confirm once again that it was in fact Melvin he had seen. My next call was following up on this wild story, so so I hopped on to the next bus across town, huddled together with commuters, holding on to ceiling rails swaying with every turn of the bus like we were meat hanging in the back of a butcher's van. I walked quite a bit from the bus stop towards the docks. Most of the area was restricted, off limits to members of the general public given how hazardous it could be. I wasn't concerned. In my line of work, I usually had to get into places I wasn't supposed to be. Pulling a pair of wire cutters from my jacket pocket, I snipped through the chain-link fence that surrounded the warehouse Clarence had directed me to. The place wasn't guarded. After all, it was empty. Lifting up the wire mesh and slipping underneath through the gap, I grabbed my flashlight and headed in. The warehouse was well and truly deserted, previously used for storage, but now just an empty space that was being left vacant, wasted in its lack of use. All around was silence, occasionally broken by beads of water dripping from the skylight into a puddle on the ground. Suddenly I heard a new noise, a crunch of something being squashed under the sole of my shoe. I lifted my foot and shone my torchlight downwards, looking to see what I'd just stepped on. It was a cockroach, far bigger and fatter than any one I'd ever seen, smashed to pieces underneath my shoe. I stamped the rest of it off, a little disgusted as how everyone gets when they see a roach, dead or alive. That's when I noticed another sound, a low, dull buzzing. My initial thought was that it was electrical, maybe a generator that was still running. I started searching around for the source of the sound, thinking that if I could flip the switch, it might turn on some lights in here that would make searching for Melvin a little easier. Suddenly, as I turned a corner, the buzzing sound got louder. It wasn't just closer, it was angrier, more intense. What was worse was that I'd walked directly into a cloud of something, or lots of somethings. Tiny flies were whizzing past my ears, the noise of their wings so close it was almost deafening. Meanwhile, even more were zipping around my face, landing on my skin and rubbing their little germ-coated legs together. Waving my arms wildly, I tried my best to disperse the swarm, clearing a few of them away as I tumbled into the next room. My flashlight clattered to the floor as I crawled over to pick it back up, blindly swatting more of the insects away in the dark. That's when I saw him, the vermin god. With no light in the room, only the beam from my flashlight, I hadn't noticed it at first. The second the light fell over the writhing mass, it shifted. As a matter of fact, it didn't stop moving, not once. It was a seething assortment of vermin, 
Mostly black rats, their fur wet with what I could only assume was water straight from the sewer. But there was more. Worms, huge spiders, thick roaches dropping off of the huge shape as it turned. It stood up, a mass of animals and insects standing like a man lumbering towards me. Creatures were falling off with every step, only to crawl back in and join the rest. I pushed myself back on the floor trying to get away from what I assumed to be a horrific monster. Something controlling all the rats and vermin, making them form around it like a cloak of pure filth and decay. The stench of it as well, that foul, unclean smell hanging in the air and lingering at the back of my throat made me want to be sick. It was so repugnant that it kept me crawling back until my back was pressed up against the wall, trapping me between it and the vermin god. It leaned closer, reaching out an arm covered in grime and cockroaches all crawling over each other. I turned away and closed my eyes, yelling out into the dark for anyone to come and help. A voice said weakly. I looked up at it, panting and shaking in fear. With trembling fingers, I lifted my flashlight higher, right up to the head of the vermin god. Beneath the mass of rats crawling over it, and the bugs wriggling about below them, a pair of eyes glinted in my flashlight's beam. Human eyes. They were eyes I'd seen before, the same hopelessness behind them as when he used to ask for change outside my building. It was Melvin. That's when I started to see beneath the vermin coating his body catching brief glimpses of his arms and chest, just as one rat moved, but before another slipped in and took its place. His skin was pockmarked with bites and scratches, some fresh and still bleeding, others that had started to dry. Beneath the shroud of crawling insects and rodents, his face had gotten gaunt, coated in a thick layer of dirt. He wasn't controlling these things. If anything, the vermin seemed to be using him as some kind of host. Just as I edged a little closer to him, Considering the idea of reaching into the mass and pulling Melvin free, one of the rats bit me. I dropped my torch at the pain of the tiny needly teeth piercing my skin and started to feel more of them crawling up my ankles. I turned heel and ran all the way out of the warehouse. By the time I was far enough away, the rats that had leapt onto me had crawled back off, heading back inside into their vermin god. Now go and check out SCP-1025, Encyclopedia of Common Diseases and SCP-3760 Like a Doll's Eye for more sickening stories of other anomalous illnesses that are guaranteed to make your skin crawl. Or maybe that's just the rats you're feeling.